Right, so you may ask, what exactly are the benefits of high dynamic range when compared to the low dynamic range? Okay, here we have 32-bit EXR. It's a high dynamic range environment panorama made by Greg Zal. And because this image uh, has a 32-bit color depth, it can store light values that is higher than 1. For example, if you sample this bright spot at the window, you will see that the red channel is 21, green 30, and blue 50. And if you click on this bag, you'll notice that the red channel is just 0.006 and so on. So the contrast ratio between these two points is very high, and 32-bit images can store this luminosity range. And this is so, so, so much better than 8-bit images that can hold just values between black and white, between 0 and 1. The 32-bit images have this enormous advantage of storing values beyond the white point of the monitor. For example, the high dynamic range image can store the brightness of a light bulb, the sky, the sun that uh, can be as bright as 80,000 times brighter than the brightest pixel on the screen. It can even store the full luminosity of Elton John. And because of that superpower, of being able to store the real-life light values, high dynamic range environments work really well as light sources. The first benefit of HDR is of course realism. You can just sample the surroundings, the full 360 degrees panorama and use it for lighting. In Blender, in 3ds Max and pretty much everywhere. Every point, every pixel of this image illuminates the 3D objects in the scene. Of course, you can achieve the similar effect by constructing the whole 3D world around your objects and using many different light sources with textures on them and so on. But HDR environment gives you the same kind of thing but faster and with incredible realism based on the real world data. Ooh, that was scientific. Huh. Let's now switch to this HDR that is called LAPA to showcase the second benefit of the high dynamic range images. Let's take a look at this awesome image by Greg. So it has a very bright spots where the sky is peeking through the leaves. These tiny spotlights produce very hard shadows. And at the same time, the rest of the image pretty much works as the giant softbox, producing very soft shadows. And thus, we see at the same time the hard shadows and the soft shadows. And we can say that the HDRs produce different kind of shadows at the same time. We can call this effect variable softness. It works as if you have a different kind of light sources set up around the model and they have different size and different brightness and different color and even different texture. Alright, and the third benefit of the high dynamic range is lens effects. Let's switch back to Glass Passage HDR. I'm going to rotate it a little bit on the Z-axis to be able to see the lamps. I'm doing this to test how the depth of field effect will work. So let's go to the camera settings. Select camera, go to camera settings. Scroll down, and you have this radius and size. Let's increase the size of the aperture. <laughs> Everything got blurred. We have to tweak the distance. And you also have the number of blades that you can see in the bokeh effect. Right now it's set to 5, so we see this pentagon shape. But what we also see is that the bokeh effect is very pronounced. It has the hard edges and it looks incredibly realistic. And if you tried to do this with 8-bit image, you would notice that it doesn't work like this. The bokeh effect loves high dynamic range. And let's test now the motion blur. Enable the motion blur checkbox in the render settings. Now I'm gonna open the timeline and animate the camera move. Select the camera, press I and set the rotation keyframe. This was frame number 0. Let's jump to frame number 3 and uh, press shift f and rotate the camera slightly and insert yet another keyframe by pressing i and selecting rotation so we have animated the rotation of the camera let's now jump to the frame in between these two keyframes and we have motion blur enabled now let's just click render and we see these gorgeous gorgeous streaks of light as if the light was smeared across the screen and again, that looks incredibly realistic because the lamp pixel brightness was higher than 1. In fact, the brightness of this point was higher than 100. And that makes the cycles render apply motion blur as expected. 
You could have taken this image with your camera and got the same motion blur practically. Just for the sake of comparison, take a look at these two renders. First one is made using the low dynamic range image, and the second one is cool. Mm hmm. You got it. Alright, cool. Uh, the fifth benefit of the high dynamic range is physically plausible glare. I'm going to select this interior HDRI and uh, pretty much hit the render button. But before I do that, I'm gonna collapse this timeline. Because it drives me insane. Okay, and hit the render button. Uh, the materials in this scene have a glossy component to them, so they reflect the environment, and thus they have very bright points. Let's take a brief look at the red ball shader. I've set up this test scene just to isolate these two objects. And here we have two spheres. The right one has a simple diffuse material, and obviously it doesn't produce such extremely bright points. And this other sphere has a mixed material made of diffuse and glossy shaders. So it's the glossy shader which catches the reflections from our HDR environment. And that's also why having an HDR environment illuminating your scene is beneficial. Because you get such intensive reflections with the higher light values, which look great and realistic. Alright, let's now open the Compositor tab in the Node Editor. Click on Use Nodes to activate the Environment Nodes, basically and go shift a filter glare and drop this glare effect in between these nodes and tadam the pixel values higher than one receive this glare effect let's remove the glare effect for a moment and take a look at the pixel values so this pixel over here has a red value of 6.9 green is 8.8 .8, and blue is 13 a pretty highlight values which triggered the glare effect and if you take a look at the threshold setting in the glare node, you'll notice that it's set to 1. What it actually means is that the pixels which are brighter than 1 receive the glare in effect. And everything below 1 doesn't receive the glare. It's very simple. When we increase the threshold and set it to the certain value, we tell cycles not to take pixels less bright than this value into the account. For example, this point on the red sphere has the average light value of, say, 15, 16. So when we set the threshold up to 3, it doesn't affect these brightest points very much. When we set it to 8, we start seeing how it starts to cut out the less intensive parts. And now only the most extreme regions contribute to the glare effect. Uh, that's how it works. And if we try to set it to 13, we practically kill it. Okay, with the exception of this point. And also now we are aware that there are practically no pixels brighter than 13 in this image. I hope that makes sense, and now I'm gonna set that threshold back to 1. And under these conditions, uh, this effect is very, very physically plausible at least, if not physically correct. I'm slightly suspicious of these physically correct terms, so I prefer to use physically plausible. You can try switching from uh, streaks to fog glow style. It'll look slightly less aggressive, slightly less in your face. And that post-processing stuff is one of the very cool benefits of scene-referred workflow. The workflow that depends on the high dynamic range data. And by the way, Cycles, the Blender Render Engine, is a scene-referred renderer. The next benefit of high dynamic range that we have been talking about for a few minutes already is the insane luminosity values. Let's take a look at this rooftop HDRI and why it produces the hard shadows. I will switch to the filmic color management now and in the next video I'll explain how it works. For now let's take a look at the sky and at the sun of this HDRI. And why does the sun cast so razor sharp shadows in this HDRI? Because there are many HDRIs that doesn't help you to produce the hard shadows. Okay, so let's try reducing the exposure and check out what happens. Uh, as we're reducing the exposure, we are revealing more and more details in the clouds and in the halo of the sun, and the sun disk is getting smaller and smaller. So now we can see the actual outline of the disk. This is the actual size of the light source in the Blender scene, uh, how the cycles will interpret it. Let's uh, render it out and check the actual values. I'm pressing F12 for render. Let's wait for a little while and now left click on the disk. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit to not miss it. Uh huh. 
And if we now click on the sky, you'll notice that uh, the values of the sky is about 45 on all channels. And now if you click in the center of the sun, you'll notice something incredible. Of course, we're dealing here with the high dynamic range, but this 88,000 in the red channel, 79,000 in the green channel and 53 on the blue channel. Holy moly, this tiny area of the HDRI environment overpowers everything else, basically. So even if the rest of the HDRI illuminates the scene, this part really illuminates it. In other words, its contribution to the lighting is insanely high because of the insanely high color values encoded into the 32-bit image. And the last but not the least important thing is dynamic exposure. So we have this insanely wide range of color values and what we can do is animate the camera exposure as if it adapts uh, to the lighting. And once again, do it in a physically plausible way uh, without the blown out parts and other shenanigans. So uh, here we have the dope sheet and you can see a bunch of keyframes. Uh, these are the camera exposure keyframes. I just animated a couple of values. So for example, let's scroll up to frame uh, 93, set the exposure like this and right click on it and click insert keyframe. As simple as that. And now we can scroll up to another keyframe and repeat the, the steps. What I did earlier is set up this keyframe on frame 192, where the exposure is set to minus 3.6. And later on, when the camera animates uh, to show us the table, I set up this keyframe right here and uh, set the exposure higher. And these simple tricks plus high dynamic range images plus uh, rubber duck gives us an amazing render. Okay, guys, these are the main benefits of using 32-bit images as opposed to using just 8-bit JPEGs, especially when it comes to image-based lighting, because image-based lighting loves high dynamic range. Oh, and also, if you wondered how the shaky camera motion was created, check out the handheld camera motion tutorial on creativeshrimp.com.